We're here today to present our Eve's Bayou fan theory and film breakdown that we originally presented on our Axiom Amnesia channel in November and December of 2022. But wait, we have also provided additional original commentaries. So if you did happen to see those original ones, you want to be sure that you watch this one because we do talk about some extra stuff. So stay tuned and take a ride with us about Eve's Bayou. I'm Height. And I'm Cherie. And you've discovered Axiom Amnesia. I can't wait to talk about this movie. But first... We want to thank all of the supporters who've helped to make this video possible. If you want your name to appear alongside these contributors, make a one-time donation via Cash App or click the thanks button on this video, or you can head on over to patreon.com slash axiomamnesia or become a channel member by clicking the join button to enjoy all of the benefits of becoming a monthly subscriber. This is how we went into our original fan theory on Eve's Bite. You've probably seen the 1997 cult classic film Eve's Bayou countless times. After over 25 years of watching this movie, we finally figured out what really happened in the film that was in our faces the entire time. The movie Eve's Bayou centers around Eve Baptiste, a 10-year-old girl and her family living in rural Louisiana in the 1960s. At the opening of the film, we hear Eve, as an adult, narrate the line, The summer I killed my father, I was 10 years old. Up front, we know that Eve's father, Louis, a prominent doctor, will meet his end, and we're sucked into the story of how a 10-year-old is responsible for her father's demise. By the end of the film, adult narrator Eve restates the line from the beginning of the movie but this time absolves herself of responsibility for her father's end, saying, the summer my father said goodnight, I was 10 years old. The viewer likely assumes that it's really the unfortunate sequence of events that we've just seen that make it clear that it wasn't Eve's fault after all. The storyline of Eve wanting to punish her father for what she believes he has done to her sister Cecily was an overlapping plot that provided the perfect misdirection of the viewer's attention away from what really happened in the film. But what if there was something more sinister at play that really is responsible for Eve's father's tragic end, and it wasn't just Lewis's philandering ways that led to his demise? Remember Eve's Aunt Moselle and how she was cursed as a black widow? having had all three of her husbands meet their own tragic ends? What if it was actually Moselle's curse that ultimately led to her brother, Eve's father's end? I know, I know, you already want to say this is impossible, but let us explain all of the clues in the movie Eve's Bayou that add up to the very plausible alternate theory that it was Moselle's generational curse that was ultimately responsible for Lewis's demise. And we'll also tell you about Eve's sister Cicely's role in the ending of her own father. I want to emphasize that this is just our alternate theory about the movie. We don't need you to explain the common interpretation of the film as if we don't already understand that. The movie is a work of fiction. It's art open to interpretation. So just about anything is possible as long as there's evidence in the film to back it up. So in this opening scene, we get a chance to see what Eve's Bayou is all about. Adult Eve states that she's killed her father when she was 10 years old. The summer I killed my father, I was 10 years old. And she explains that she's got a brother and a sister who are nine years old and 14. My brother Poe was nine and my sister Cicely had just turned 14. You know, you're sort of looking at it like, okay, so what is Eve's Bayou? You get the idea that Eve's Bayou is this place where even her family are descendants of Eve, who was an enslaved woman who bore a French aristocrat, 16 children. The town we lived in was named after a slave. When General Jean-Paul Baptiste was stricken with cholera, his life was saved by the powerful medicine of an African slave woman called Eve. 
And this was land given to her as part of that. In return for his life, he freed her and gave her this piece of land by the bayou. And the characters that we are about to see are descendants of that woman, Eve. We are the descendants of Eve and Jean-Paul Baptiste. As the opening scene happens, we're taking from a rural swamp looking area explaining kind of what Eve's Bayou, the place is all about. And we're taken into this house. The song that is being played is a Creole Zodico song titled C'est pas la peine braille, which kind of translates to there's no need to cry. There's no need to worry. But I think the film is already set in a way that lets us know that something bad is going to happen. And I think we need to be worried. So we're sort of on the edge of our seats. As we're looking at this party, we see two people who we find out are Mr. and Mrs. Moreau. And they're dancing together at the party. We also see a lot of other very well-dressed black folks. And they look like they're kind of upper class black folks for 1962. So this party tells us a lot about the dynamic of Eve, her family, and of the community of Eve's Bayou. Basically, what we see is that you have Eve, and she's got a sister, Cecily, and a brother, Poe. We see her parents, Louis and Roz, and then we see her aunt, Moselle. And they're all having a wonderful time, and they're so happy. We get a little bit of insight into their personalities, too, because Eve is kind of a prankster, you know? Yes, that's right. And we do see that Eve's father, Lewis, appears to be kind of what envy of the women, a ladies man, and even holds the eye of his own daughters because they really are smitten by his personality as such are the other women. Yeah. And you even see Lewis's mother say that, you know, all the women in town think he's like the second coming of Christ. You must be so proud. Your son is the best color doctor in all of Louisiana. And also in terms of personality, we find out that Eve's sister, older sister, Cicely, is kind of a more serious person. She sees the kids running around. Eve is this prankster. But then Cicely is very serious and she's demure. She's sort of becoming this woman, a young woman, and trying to be very serious. And in fact, she even quotes Romeo and Juliet and basically tells her brother and sister to settle down at this party. Mercutio. The prince expressly hath forbid this bandying in Verona streets. Another interesting dynamic that we see at the party is that at first we saw Maddie Moreau dancing with her husband, Lenny, and, you know, they're dancing seductively. But then we see Maddie Moreau start dancing with Louis Batiste, Eve's father, and they are dancing pretty flirtatiously. And then the next thing you know, Lewis's two daughters, Eve and Cicely, kind of looking on, wanting their father to dance with them. We also see that Lewis asks Cicely, his daughter, to dance. Come on, baby doll, let's show him how to dance. And Eve is clearly jealous because she is relegated to the role of holding and passing out the champagne. I think that's a, something you're going to see throughout the entire film is this competition between Lewis and all of the girls and ladies in his life. While watching her father and her sister dance, Eve was so overwhelmed with jealousy that she ran out into the outhouse shed garage area and fell asleep. Eve awakens to sounds of a man and a woman. And we know what those sounds are. And she looks up and she sees that it's her father and Maddie Moreau. Eve is so upset that she cries out and they are startled in the midst of their getting it on. Lewis turns on the light and he sees that his daughter has witnessed what he and Maddie Moreau are doing. They're caught. Lewis does what any loving father would do. He goes over and he tries to comfort his 10 year old daughter who is clearly shaken up and crying and startled and confused by all that she's seen while Maddie just tries to fix her dress. <laughs> In a weird twist here, Eve felt like she needed to apologize to Miss Moreau and her father. Sorry I scared you, Mrs. Moreau. 
they're the ones in the wrongdoing. But, you know, here she is as a polite young little girl apologizing that she has scared and startled them in this very awkward situation. This has Eve questioning everything in her life at this point. You know, is her family intact? What does this mean? Her father, you know, making out with this other woman and probably doing more after he tells her that he loves her. She says, do you love mama? You love mama? And his response is interesting. He doesn't say, yes, I love your mama. He says, your mama is the most beautiful and perfect woman. Your mama is the most beautiful, perfect he goes on to allay her fears by then saying, you know, your mama's a lady and I'll always love her. Your mama's a lady and I'll always love her. Clearly, it's like he wants publicly to have this beautiful lady, but obviously he might have wanted a freak in the bed. How come you never dance with me? Eve's father assures Eve that in the future, he will make a concerted effort to dance with her. So she will get the dances that she is jealous that her sister is getting from her father. From now on, we'll dance at every party, right? When we see Eve in the last scene, we're thinking, okay, she's happy. The father's going to dance with her. And then she goes upstairs to bed after her mom comes down and says, it's time for bed. You see her come into the room with her sister, Cicely. She's clearly visibly upset. So that was kind of a maybe a front that she was putting on her for her parents. She begins to cry and confesses to her sister that she saw Maddie Moreau and the father. Daddy, Mrs. Moreau. And that they were doing more than just kissing. And it's very important for the future to note that Cicely defends her father here because she doesn't want Eve to have this negative impression of her father and her love is so overwhelming for her father. Don't be stupid. Daddy wouldn't touch that cow. Just stop it. Then Cicely begins to cry. And there's something interesting about the way Cicely responds, not just as a daughter, but she sort of responds in the way that you'd respond if you found out that your husband was cheating. Stop it. So then we see Cicely do something that's really interesting to make both herself and her sister Eve feel better. She retells what happened between Maddie Moreau and their father by saying that they just came in and they were looking for another bottle of wine. Daddy tells a joke and she's laughing. And that's what woke you up. I'm going to tell you what happened. They came in to get some more wine and daddy told her a joke and she fell against him laughing and they woke you up. And then Eve is like, are you sure? You sure? Because Eve knows what she just saw. And then Cicely is like, yes, I'm sure this is what happened. So they're actively trying to give themselves a false memory to save their feelings from the reality of what's actually happening. So Harry and Lewis get into an argument about Harry driving home drunk and Cicely comes out and basically plays the adult in a situation. Daddy, Uncle Harry, stop it. It's late. You want to raise the dead? I guess it's to show her maturity and that she is not just a mere child. She is a very responsible, mature young lady. She comes out like she's a grown woman telling her parents what to do and her aunt and uncle what to do. And they oblige. Another thing that we need to point out is that we are clearly dealing with Louisiana Creoles and we see them go back and forth in between speaking Creole and English at various parts within the movie. Um, and this is important from a cultural perspective. I'm sick of your shit. We see that after this fight, you know, with this party being over and Moselle and Harry are headed home, that the compromise is that Moselle is going to drive. You're either going to let Moselle drive or, or, or y'all going to stay here tonight. And we see Moselle take the keys and she and Harry get in the car. We see a montage of images and it appears to be Eve's premonitions or memories of something that happened not in her presence. 
And this is the first time we actually see this spider. And we do see Harry's name on a tombstone. So the indications are that something bad has happened. Right. It shows the spider twice. The second time we see spider, it appears to be two spiders and one spider is consuming the other spider. So in the next scene, it's confirmed when we see Eve placing flowers on Harry's grave and she says, Uncle Harry, Uncle Menard and Uncle Anderson. So these are the three husbands of her aunt Moselle who have had an untimely passing. After visiting the cemetery where she places flowers on the graves of her uncles, Eve goes to Moselle's house where Moselle is still in bed and it's midday and she's disheveled and she has a flower to bring her to. Clearly, Moselle is completely devastated by the loss of Harry. And remember, Moselle was the one driving the car when they had the car accident. And remember, right before they left, she said, get in the car before I kill you. Give me the damn keys, Harry. Now get in the goddamn car before I kill you. And in reality, he got in the car and she killed him. Eve helps Moselle get dressed and try to get herself together because she says she has clients coming. And next thing we see that Moselle is having these flashbacks, I suppose, of her three husbands kind of seeing them in mirrors. And this is just torture for her as she tries to move on with life. Moselle says that she loved them, that she swears that she loved these men. I loved them. And then we see Eve try to comfort her, and she said, it's not your fault that they die. It's not your fault they die. Not that they died like past tense, but that they die as in there's this perpetual thing, and these men are going to die your husbands. So Moselle explains to Eve that when she was even Eve's age, around the age of 10, that she could look at people and see their futures. Even when I was your age, before I ever did the counseling, I could look at people, complete strangers, and see their whole lives so clear. But yet she had this blind spot when it came to meeting her own husbands. But I looked at each of my husbands. Never saw a thing. She couldn't see their future. Maybe they were just too close, but she could not tell what would happen to them and that they would meet these terrible ends. This explains the previous scene of Eve's premonitions. I think that Moselle understood that Eve might be having premonitions, although they didn't actually talk about it directly. She sees the signs that maybe Eve is like her in this way. We find a little bit more about Moselle's profession. She calls herself a counselor, but she's like a psychic counselor. People come and pay her in order to have their futures read. And she knows that Eve is going to be there and will listen as she gives her counseling sessions. She just tells her to be quiet and you'll be able to hear what's going on. Now go on. Make yourself invisible for a while. You'll be able to hear. This is her way of training Eve. So we see that the first client comes in and she says that she's looking for her son and that they've been looking for him for a while and they can't find him. It's my boy. My boy's run off and I don't know where. We get a glimpse into how Moselle is able to read people. She holds her palms out and then asks for the person to put their hands on top. And then she's able to see what's going on in this person's life. So Moselle sees that this woman's son is in a hospital and she tells the woman specifically, hey, you're going to find your son next Tuesday. He's in the hospital, but he's on drugs. You'll find him in Detroit next Tuesday. So again, we get to see how the transactions happen. After she gives the information, the woman leaves the money or an envelope, presumably a payment over to the side. I think people come and they pay whatever they can pay for her services. Eve falls asleep and wakes up and the next client is there devastated because she's been told by Moselle that her niece has spent all the money. The money is gone, Madame Renard. Your niece spent it all. (laughs) Moselle opens up some of her things and gives some instructions, telling her that this is going to make the situation right. I want you to get a small bag of the skin of chamois to paste this piece. Keep the bag next to your skin. 
Eve takes particular interest in this because this is more than just reading somebody's future. This is actively saying that part of this gift is having the ability to intervene and do something more than just say, hey, this is the future or this is what's going to happen. So in the next scene, we can see what could be called kind of the debriefing about how these psychic readings go between Moselle and Eve. Eve says that Moselle is not supposed to be practicing voodoo. And, you know, Moselle seems un unaffected by this. And then she goes on to ask about the woman that Moselle has told to wear this bag of stuff around her neck that's supposed to help with the situation. And she justifies it by saying, hey, she was desperate. She was desperate. Eve wants to know, is this really going to work? Does it work? Moselle says she doesn't know, but she doesn't think the woman will sue her. We'll see. But what if it don't? I don't think she'll sue me. Eve is learning more and more about how all of this works. Yeah, but she still seems to have doubt about whether or not this is going to work. Moselle does not assure her that it will work. So I think that Eve can walk away from this and say that, well, she's just doing this to make the woman feel better. So tell us in the comments if you think Moselle believes that this actually works, but she's given Eve a little bit piece by piece because she doesn't want to tell her too much about the secrets of the trade just yet. So Moselle and Eve arrive back at Eve's house to find Eve's mother sitting there crying. And then the next scene we see is Eve and her brother eavesdropping outside of the door. And we can overhear Eve's mother saying, how dare this woman call the house? I've got three of his children. I said, well, I got three of his damn babies. Cecily makes Eve and her brother Poe go away by telling them that she's going to tell on them, the snitch, that they're out, set, out there eavesdropping. If they'd have wanted you to hear, they'd have left the door open. I'm telling. And Cecily herself begins to eavesdrop. And then she sees that the father, Lewis, has arrived home. And again, Cecily wants to defend him. So she says, hey, daddy, don't go in there. Go somewhere else for a while because these three women, your mother, your sister, and your wife are really mad with you. Go down to Kings and come back later. Go quick. Lewis doesn't care. He shakes it off and he even opens up the door with the three women staring daggers in their eyes, looking at him and then just says, they're always mad and kind of laughs it off. <laughs> they always mad. In the next scene, we see Eve and her father going on some of his house calls as a doctor, a black doctor in this small town. So a funny thing happens. The first patient that Lewis is going to see is the woman who was there to see Moselle and found out that her niece had spent all the money. So she's wearing this bag of stuff around her neck. Lewis tells her, oh, you've been taking your pills. That's why you're fine. You've been taking your pills. Yes, everything's going to be just fine, Louise. And then she pulls out the bag around her neck and is like, everything's going to be just fine. Everything will be just because she has faith in what she's doing with what Moselle gave her. So Moselle, on one hand, is giving her a solution. And then her brother, Lewis, on another hand, is giving her a solution. It's sort of like science against... Mysticism. Yes. The next patient we see is Stevie, who was told by Lewis that her lungs are clear as a bell. Basically kind of like, what are you here for? Your lungs are clear as a bell, Stevie. He's here with his young daughter and doing the house call, but Stevie apparently wants something else. And then we see Stevie kind of flirtatiously say to the doctor, well, can you give me something for the pain? Could you give me something for the pain? And then Lewis basically shuts the door right in Eve's face. It is like, you know, go out here and wait while I give her something for the pain. So it's some insight into how Eve's father is conducting business around town. So Eve is an inquisitive and observant young lady. And we know that in the previous scenes, we had seen the mother upset and Eve has been eavesdropping. And the next thing she decides to ask her father is, does he want other children? Do you ever want other kids? 
He's sort of taken aback by this line of questioning from his daughter, and he dismisses it. Well, I don't see anything in there that would make you say something so stupid. But interestingly, as soon as he hears these questions, he don't want to hear any of that, any more of that. So he's been going house calls with Eve. Now he's like, hey, look, I got to go to the hospital. I got to take you home. So he's going to cut it off. I got to go to the hospital. I have to take you home. Oh, no. And one of the things we see is sort of this every time you ask too much, every time you go too far, every time you inquire too much as a child, then it's going to be cut off. Doors are going to be shut in your face. And, you know, because these are things that I don't want to talk about. Yeah. And part of the reason that she actually asked in that moment is the house call with Stevie. So she know what her father has done with Miss Moreau and she see what had happened with Stevie and she heard the conversation about the babies. So she's basically putting two and two together and confronted her father. So in the next scene, we see Roz and Moselle taking a walk in some of the finest dresses you've ever seen for the day. I mean, they got on pearls and they're just taking a walk down the street dressed like they're dressed for a party. But this is just everyday living in 1962, Louisiana, black aristocratic life. But we get some insight here into Roz and who she is as a wife and as a mother. You know that Moselle is still depressed over Harry's death. And Roz is upset because apparently the woman who called her house was calling to say that she was pregnant. And she confesses in this discussion she has with Moselle that she wonders what the woman did or what was done because she knows that her husband is a fixer. I was just wondering what happened with that woman. I suppose he fixed it. He knows how to fix things. And so she assumes that he fixed the situation of this woman being pregnant. And we all know what that means. He's a doctor, which would have probably been pretty easy for him to do. And if we look at the time, this is like 1962 in the deep South. So here he is doing things to fix the situations he's caused by his philandering. But we also find out that Ross has moved away from the city where her own family is. And she's here isolated. I said to myself, he's a man who can fix things. He's a healer. He'll take care of me. So I leave my family and I move to this swamp and I find out he's just a man. She viewed him in the beginning kind of almost godlike the way that Lewis's mother had referenced that the women in town looking at him like he's the second coming of Christ. But then after she got there, started to experience things because she says she's moved from her family to the swamp. She experiences these things. And then she realizes he's just a man. We also see Moselle give her a bit of supposedly comforting words, telling her that she and her brother Louis are much the same and that one day Louis is going to turn around and see her for the first time again and realize that everything he's looking for out there, he has at home with her. We're two of a kind, my brother and I. One day he'll turn around and he will see you for the first time. And then he'll stop looking for what he already has. So Roz and Moselle arrive at the local market where they run into El Zora, who is basically a fortune teller. And Roz decides that she wants to have her fortune told. Well, let's get our fortunes told. Of course, Moselle, because they're in the same business, is like, oh, I would want my fortune told. I'm a psychic counselor. Not by her. Roz, that woman can predict heat in August. Roz, I am a psychic counselor. And she looks down her nose at El Zora because she doesn't think that she's good. She calls her a sideshow attraction. El Zora is a sideshow attraction. But Roz decides to get her fortune read anyway. While getting a reading, Elzora tells Roz that she is in pain. You in pain, my daughter. And that her pain will basically end, but not how she thinks it's going to end. There is an end to your problem, though not one you imagined. Stay quiet and wait. In three years' time, you will be happy again. Because sometimes a soldier falls on his own sword. Sometimes a soldier falls on his own sword. And that she needs to look to her children. Children, plural. Look to your children. That's it? Just wait three years and everything will be fine? Look to your children. 
Now, the funny thing is that whenever you're getting a reading or something like this, and you see this, especially in these movies, all of the things that are being said can be interpreted in a number of different ways. We've all seen those psychic shows before. And so a lot of the interpretation is going to is up to the person receiving the message. And you're going to think it means whatever you think it means. Right. And that's a lot of what happens with Ross. But with our theory that it's Moselle's curse that actually takes Lewis out in the end, Elzora is an important factor in this because we have questions about how Moselle became cursed in the first place and who may have laid that curse. There is some animosity between Elzora and Moselle, but we don't exactly know why. But Elzora has more information than she's actually telling. Roz is not happy with this idea that it's going to take three years for her to be happy again. She wants more information. Elzora is not going to give her any more than she's going to give her. So she pays the dollar and she walks away. Thank you. And then she tells Moselle that she was right, meaning Moselle was right. This woman doesn't know anything. And so she dismisses her. But now Moselle, you know, has her butt up on her back and is like, I'm going to march over here and get my fortune read. Elzora tells Moselle that she basically doesn't even have to throw out the bones to find out what her fortune is. I don't need no cat bones to tell your fortune, Moselle Baptiste. And then goes on to tell Moselle that she's a black widow. She is cursed. You are a curse. A black widow. And any man that marries you is going to meet his end just like the other ones. And it'll always be that way. Next man who marries you is a dead man like the others. Always be that way. Even though Moselle knows that she's cursed to hear it come from somebody else and for Elzora to just tell her this. It just sends her mad and hurt in the moment. And her first instinct is to deny it, you know, and she calls Elzora a horrid old woman and says that she's a liar. You're an old lying witch! But Moselle knows that this is true. And according to our theory, the reason that Elzora knows that this is true and that it will always be this way is because... She laid the original curse that affects Moselle. Moselle is so upset and affected by what Elzora has told her that they leave the market immediately and she becomes almost delirious. And then we see her see a bus and she starts to have these visions and the visions show her what we'll know will later be Mr. Moreau walking up railroad tracks toward where he's going to end Lewis toward the end of the movie. And then we also see some other mixed things happen. And then Moselle passes out in front of a bus. You're telling me you're going to lock these kids up in the house for the rest of the summer because of something that old fortune teller told you? She just kept saying, look to your children. And no sooner do we leave than Moselle has this vision of a child getting hit. Pause. (laughs) So this is where the premonitions and the predictions of both Moselle and Elzora get jumbled up. So in Moselle's vision that she has right before she passes out in front of the bus, we see what we later know to be visions of Mr. Moreau. We see Eve, a kid, but we don't see this thing about a kid is going to get hit by a bus, which is what Moselle has apparently told Roz, which leads them to decide between Elzora saying, look to your children and Moselle saying that there's going to be a kid hit by a bus. All of these get mixed up together and it's interpreted as keep your kids inside because they're going to get hit by a bus. Roz, you know, I love my sister, but she's not unfamiliar with the inside of a mental hospital. Lewis. And Moselle's crazy. She is not. She knows things. People trust her. So here we see Cicely chime in to take the side of her father where he says basically that his sister is crazy and that she doesn't really have these premonitions and can't see the future. This ties into earlier scenes where Cicely basically made up a new memory for Eve on account for her father. So Cicely does believe that Moselle does have these visions, but she's basically just 
taking her father's side and denying that it actually happens. But Eve, on the other hand, takes the side of Moselle because she has these visions. So she knows that it's completely plausible. And then we see the grandmother weigh in, who is Moselle's mother and Lewis's mother. And she says, hey, Moselle may be crazy, but those visions always come true. She may be crazy, but them visions always come true. And then we see her later make the statement that, you know, back in their day, they were grateful for basically these premonitions of the signs and the wonders to kind of know something was, you know, the writing on the wall so that they could avoid bad things happening. My day, we were thankful for signs and warnings. Go on and let the little hooligans get round over. Ça va plus tranquilo to a DC. The mother's accent is pretty good. <laughs> My at this scene at the meal table we really get a hand for how maybe out of control all of the women in lewis's life are in his family because you know he's got these two daughters he's got his mother he's got his wife and another important thing that we need to pay close attention to is how cecily is bucking up against her mother and in this scene she goes so far as to say that nothing ever happens behind your back, right, Mother? And don't be rolling your eyes at your father behind my back. You're looking right at us, Mama. Nothing ever happens behind your back. Because she's not happy that the mother has made the decision that they're going to have to stay inside until Moselle says it's okay and safe for them to be out so they won't get hit by a bus, right? What if we promise not to play in traffic? Don't you use that tone of voice with me, Cicely Baptiste? She clearly is trying to usurp her mother, much in the way that teens and young adults will try to test their parents. But we see most of that being directed toward her mother, not her father. Lewis decides that he's had enough of all this and that he's going to go and do some patient visits. Well, I want to thank you all for the delightful family chat. Have patience to see. Roz is not happy because she's like, it's Sunday. Can't they wait till Monday? And Lewis comes back and says, hey, you know, illnesses happen every day of the week. Sunday. But when you find a way to put sickness on an eight hour, five day schedule, you let me know. And then we see Eve chime in and say, well, you know, some illnesses you can't put a finger on. Some sickness is hard to put a finger on. Which is a throwback to what the father had told her earlier about Stevie's illness. And we all know what they probably did behind closed doors. What was wrong with that lady? Mrs. Hobbs? Some illness hard to put a finger on. So everybody is going wild, but Lewis doesn't want to confront this. So he gets up and he gets ready to walk out and leave because certain conversations he's just not going to have. So we see that after Lewis is going out to do his house calls, Cicely follows him into his office. She is like his shadow. Instead of Roz, who is pissed with him right now, Cicely's there to see him off as he goes to work. And he says to her right before he leaves, you love your daddy? And she says, yes. And then he says, that's all I need. And he kisses her on the forehead and he walks out. You love your daddy, baby. You know I do. That's all I need. Very interesting, the parallel between this scene and much like the way that a housewife would kiss her husband as he's off to work. But instead of it being Roz doing this, we see Cecily in her role. Yes, and this is validation for Cecily that she gets her father's approval. And this was done by basically backing him at every turn. Her work towards getting her father's validation and admiration has actually worked. That little bit of reinforcement from her father when he basically reassures her that she's perfect and right gives her enough juice to go into her mother and confront her mother because of the way that she's behaved, making them stay inside and and her objections to the father working on Sunday. And she calls her mother immature. Don't you think you're being a little immature? I beg your pardon? Keeping us in the house because ain't Moselle seeing things. And not one day to go to work. What's wrong with you? Cecily has lost her mind. So we see Roz basically have to smack Cecily down because she is not going to have this type of disrespect. I mean, and the audacity of Cecily to come in there and call her mother immature and basically try to chastise her. And this is my house and you will do as I say. Do you understand? I said, do you understand? Yes, ma'am. 
But we see Sicily bow down in the end or at least not continue to fight her mother by saying that, you know, she understands when Roz gets on her. No one leaves this house until I say so. Over the next few scenes, we see the kids really going stir crazy because even though the house is big and beautiful, they have to stay inside when they're used to going outside and playing and running around the wonderful outdoors of Eve's Bayou. And we see the two daughters actually reciting Romeo and Juliet. What man art thou that thus be screamed at night? So stumblest on my counsel. By name, I know not how to tell thee. Right, which is a love story. And that kind of plays into sort of the atmosphere. And then when you think about it, especially Cicely is older, old enough to begin to be understanding love. They're going nuts, though, in the house. Tis not so deep as a well, nor so wide as a church of doors, but tis enough, true, sir. So this is another reference to Romeo and Juliet. And in the previous scene, I believe it is the balcony scene from Romeo and Juliet. And it's a part about actually listening to someone's private thoughts. And also, I believe it's a part about revealing actually who Romeo is. So it's very important to the theory and to what's actually going on in the movie about one's own memories and premonitions. And even to the fact that women and girls in this movie can actually peer into someone's thoughts. So things hit this boiling over point for Eve, you know, being cooped <laughs> up and then Sicily's in the bathroom. They're all just trying to make it being in this house. And the way it comes out for her is that she just starts going on this tirade and actually cursing this little 10 year old uh, girl is just cursing about stuff like she's a grown person. You say, God damn it. What? We've read most of the tragedies. We're starting on a goddamn comedy. Get out of the damn tub! You but in the midst of her being upset, she winds up hurting her mother's feelings because she says, you know, like, where is daddy? He's supposed to be here sometimes and he's not. And where's daddy? He's never home. He's supposed to be home sometimes. Listen, you little ingrate. Your father works hard so we can have a house with four bathrooms. Not every night he's not working. I know he's not. And we can only be left as viewers to believe that some of the tension that's happening between Roz and Lewis has him not home as much as he normally is, because clearly the children are missing him more than they normally would. And in the midst of this tirade that Eve goes on, the first thing that Roz does when Eve goes on this tirade is she tries to defend the father by saying, hey, your father is working to pay for this big house we have, essentially. Listen, you little ingrate. Your father works hard so we can have a house with four bathrooms. And Eve is like, no, he's not. I know he's not working every night. Not every night he's not working. I know he's not. Oh, well, this really hurts Roz because it chips away at this image and this facade that she has about what they're supposed to be as a family, that she's supposed to be happy. And ultimately, the adults really don't want the children to have to worry about adult issues. But I think it's a bit naive that the adults don't seem to understand that the children really are affected by what's happening between their parents and other adults in their lives. So Moselle pulls Eve to another room to basically get on her about hurting her mother's feelings. Let me bar you for a minute. It's during this conversation that Eve confesses to Moselle that she knows that the mother is nervous and upset because her father is basically cheating with other women. She's nervous because he's messing with other women. And then she goes on to confess about how she saw Louis and Maddie Moreau that night in the carriage house. It's true, I saw them. You saw who? Daddy and Mrs. Moreau. God. I was at the party, and it was worse than just kissing. They were... Hush, hush, let me... And it's something kind of funny about every time she describes it, she's like, you know, and they were rubbing bodies. It's, you know, so she's trying to communicate in her 10-year-old vocabulary that this was more than just a kiss because, you know, she's seen just a kiss, right? She's seen her parents kiss. She's seen people who love each other kiss. And this is more than that. We see pain and shock in Moselle's eyes as she hears about this. 
But her response isn't one that is comforting right off the bat. Her response is to say, keep the secret. So she asks if Eve has told anybody. Eve tells her no. And then she says, good, because if you do, I'm going to kill you. Have you told anyone? No. Well, that's good. Because if you tell anyone, anyone at all, I'm going to kill you. And then she also threatens her, hey, I'm going to hurt you if you hurt your mother's feelings like you've been doing too. And if you get careless again with your mama's feelings, I swear I'll do you wrong. So Moselle reassures Eve by telling her that her father loves her and her mother. Your daddy loves you. And he loves your mama. I know. Moselle then goes on to get into some conversation that seems quite inappropriate. And then she starts reminiscing and talking about her husbands. We are a lot the same, your father and I. <laughs> Except I don't have no children to catch me. Once again, this is the second time in the movie that she says that she and her brother are just alike. We're two of a kind, my brother and I. Now we know what she meant when she said it the first time, because then she goes on to talk about her cheating on her husband. Now, keep in mind, she goes into this story about how this guy who is her lover, you know, was so hot that he had her whole body burning. But when I was with Jose, it was like my whole body was burning. She's telling this story to a 10 year old. I don't know. <laughs> So based on this story, we find out that Moselle's second husband, Maynard, died at the hands of her lover when she refused to leave with the lover to go off with him. And that Moselle only realized how much she loved her husband when she was confronted with the situation. And the husband, Maynard, basically manned up and was not fearful when this guy was holding a gun on him. In that moment, I knew that I loved Maynard. And mind you, her mother, the grandmother that we see in this movie, was there to witness all of this as well. I believe this is like one of the first visualizations of the actual curse that Moselle has, because it's talking about her lovers and how because they're her lovers, they wind up dead. And this is one of the three who we are aware of. So we are shown that Cicely is waiting up for her father, seems to be yet again, and greets him. What you doing up? Waiting for you. What you think I'm doing up? And basically is attempting to serve him that night. What's your pleasure this evening, doctor? Scotch and water, bartender. <laughs> And Eve happens to be present. And when she sees that the father has arrived, she seems a little jealous of the relationship between Cicely and her father, Louis. So she makes herself be known, runs up, gets attention from her father, which in turn puts a look of jealousy on Cicely's face. You know what time it is? Hmm? It's time for you gals to be in bed. No, daddy. Eve intervening in this scene is actually what ruins the night for Sicily because as soon as Eve is there, then the father's like, oh, it's too late to be up. It's time to go to bed. Whereas if Eve wasn't there, the father would have allowed Sicily to continue making his drink and serve him the drink and they could have had some father daughter alone time. All of these ladies, the younger ones and the older ones are competing for time with Lewis. One of the themes that you can see throughout, even through the questioning of Eve of Moselle, is this idea of who loves who more. And that there is this idea that someone can show love or have more love for one person over another. So in this scene, we did see that this kind of is about whom the father loves the most in the minds of the daughters. So a guy shows up at Moselle's door and apparently he wants a reading or some counseling. And it is hinted that there will be a love here between Moselle and Julian. But if you think back to what happened with Elzora, then we know that any such love and according to this curse, if they fall in love and wed, then demise is coming for 
and a sure death is coming for Julian. When Julian shows up, it kind of makes you feel sorry for him already. And in a way, you all, you don't really want to see him get wrapped up in Moselle's curse because he seems like a nice guy and he confesses, hey, I've been looking for my wife for this year. My wife left me a year ago. And he's lost everything. So he doesn't even have a home to go back to once if he ever finds her, but that he can't stop looking for her because he just has to know he needs an answer. And it's really quite sad. And he seems like this nice guy and you hate to see something bad happen to him. But ne neither of them could fight the feeling. Julian is an artist and he paints this beautiful portrait of Moselle. And then, you know, it pans away from the portrait to bow chicka wow wow. So in the next scene, we see that Roz is on the phone with the police all panicked because she can't find Sicily. Where's Sicily? Officer, you don't understand. I'm afraid she might be hit by something. We like to date and bound to be after that. Mama, please. Then next thing you know, it's a rainy day. Cicely busts in the door and she's got on this really cute raincoat set. And she comes in and she's like, you know, I've been all over the place. I went to see Daddy. Then I took a bus and went to the beauty shop. Where the hell did you go? I went to visit Daddy. Then I went to the beauty parlor. And the mother is looking like, you really got your nerve. And then Cicely pulls her hat down to reveal that she has cut her hair. And prior to this, you know, Cicely's had this long ponytail and very girl-like. But now Cicely is turning into a woman. And she is really challenging this idea that, you know, staying at home like the mother had told her to do so that they won't be getting hit by a bus was just not what she was going to do. So she's going to do what she's going to do. And then she went and cut the hair. But if you look at the hairstyle, it is pretty much exactly the same hairstyle as the mother. And we see Cicely moving even more to sort of mimic and imitate her mother. And that is very interesting in this scene. And then something else happens. I walked all the way to daddy's office. And then I caught the bus to Opal's. After Cicely explained all that she had done that day, the mother, Roz, just reaches back and smacks her. And I'm alive, Mama. I didn't get hit by anything. <laughs> and the funny line when she smacks her is, you know, Cicely's trying to say, hey, look, you know, I went and did all these things. See, you're wrong. I did all these things and I didn't get hit. And then, bam, <laughs> she gets popped. Roz almost immediately regrets hitting her child and especially to smack Cicely in the face because that is even more than like popping him on the behind or something. It's a demeaning thing to smack someone in the face and it just broke Cicely in that moment, but she didn't even argue or say anything back. And then we see that Cicely's just staring blankly out the window and then Eve comes up and gives her a hug to try to comfort her from, from that. And I think the insight that we also have here is that these children were not like routinely whipped and spanked because we see that the grandmother had made the comment uh, multiple times that, you know, Eve needed to get beat or popped or her actions and getting out of line and the mouthiness warranted a spanking. When I was growing up, children did not participate in the conversation of adults. Now you are asking to get hit. You're not too big to beat. Don't do it, my daughter, mama. I don't think these kids got spanked. So then for the mother to haul off and slap Cicely in the face like this was a huge thing. Cicely later that night has on her nightgown along with a little frilly house coat and she is sneaking downstairs to wait for her father. But lo and behold, her mother is sitting there in an armchair waiting for her father because the mother is waiting up because she got a few things that she wants to say to Louis. At the same time, we see Cicely kind of roll her eyes like, why is she down here? You know, I'm trying to get my me time with dad. I think Roz is trying to apologize to her daughter. When I was your age, I was just like you. I thought I knew everything. Now even the things I'm most familiar with seem mysterious to me. But also Roz is starting to realize what has happened. She's saying, first and foremost, that she's the mother and she's trying to protect her. It's my job to protect you as best I can. And that she loves Cicely. But I know I love you. And that, you know, her move for them not 
being allowed to go outside and everything is part of her protection as a mother. If you disobey my orders, leave this house again. I swear I'll lock you in your room. Do you hear me? She then informs Cicely that she doesn't want her waiting up for the father anymore. So no more waiting up. And then you're, you know, pouring him drinks at night and stuff. None of that. And to go back upstairs. Go back to bed. I'm waiting up for your father tonight. I don't want you waiting up for him anymore. And then Cicely tries to object, but Roz really puts her foot down and we see Cicely go back upstairs and then cut to the next scene. Roz and Lewis are having it out. The kids all can hear her screaming at him and the argument that they're having over the state of their family. Moselle. So presumably some time has passed and we see Julian and Moselle together having a conversation and Julian is saying, hey, I got to go find my wife. I have to find my wife. Of course, his wife has fallen in love with someone else and Moselle tries to tell him like, look, she's not coming back to you. And then I told you she's not coming back. She's fallen in love. And he's like, oh, I'm not looking for her for that. I'm looking for her to divorce her so that I can marry you, Moselle. And then that's when Moselle kind of panics a little bit and says, hey, you can't marry me now. But you can't possibly marry me. I can't let that happen. We all know why Moselle doesn't want him to marry her because she knows what his fate will be if he does. Then she tries to tell him the truth. And she says, OK, bear with me. And then she says, I'm cursed. Bear with me. I'm cursed. But instead of saying, look, I'm cursed and every man I marry meets a bad end, she says, I'm cursed and I'm barren. I can't have children. I'm barren. So she kind of doesn't have the guts to actually say what the real deal is, probably because she's afraid of losing him, I would guess. Basically, Julian reassures her. They start kissing and right in the middle of the kissing, when the kiss gets good, we hear screeches and then a child is hit by a bus. And we see that the threat of the kids is over. This premonition that Moselle has had has come to pass and it is not one of their kids that has been hit by the bus. Roz and her kids, the two youngest ones, celebrating the fact that they don't have to stay inside anymore. Roz says they're going to have a barbecue outside and everything. Roz says to Eve, hey, go get Cicely. Let her know what's going on. You know, I think she's still mad at me from yesterday. And we see Cicely now in the bed when she goes up to get Cicely. She's got the covers all over her. And this scene is almost identical to the scene where we saw Moselle mourning after the loss of Harry and she didn't get out of bed and didn't get dressed and all of that stuff. And the same thing is true for Cicely. Cicely's hair is all over the place, her grown woman hairstyle now. And she says she doesn't want to get up. And Eve is like, come on, come on, get up. She's all excited and everything. And then Cicely pushes Eve, who falls on the floor and then sees some soiled clothing, which is indicative of the fact that Cicely has become a woman, so to speak. She's begun menstruating. Eve realizes what it is. And then she says, hey, you know, I'm going to tell that you got your period and you think because you got it, this means that, you know, you don't have to act civilized and whatever. You think just because you got blood in your pants, you don't have to act civilized no more? Shut up! And so she knows what buttons to push. And she says she's going to tell the father. And so she's like, you know, Cicely's got her period. And Cicely's got a period. I'm going to tell daddy. <laughs> then Cicely just comes after her like a mad woman. So after Cicely calms down and she is up in the room, we see that Lewis arrives home to, you know, find out what all has happened. That's when Roz informs him that she thought Cicely was having a seizure and that she just basically went crazy and also tells him that Cicely had started her period and asked if he knew. It's like she went crazy. We thought she was having a seizure or something. We were so scared. She started her period. Did you know that? He said he didn't know. And so he goes in to try to see what's up with Cicely and also, you know, just to check her out medically. 
she says to him, I don't want you looking at me. And she didn't want to be touched or anything like that. And you see Moselle sitting there with her. And so the signs are kind of like something has happened and we don't know what happened to Sicily. Go away, daddy. I don't want you here. I don't want you looking at me. Okay. I know a nice lady doctor we can take you to. The mother is blaming herself. Because she asked prior to Lewis going in the room, hey, is you think it's my fault because I slapped Cicely? Is it my fault, you think, because I hit her? No, Roz, it's not your fault. We're left to wonder, you know, what's Cicely's deal? What's the problem? Two weeks or so has passed, and Cicely is depressed, not talking, not eating, and her parents are very worried about her. They've even consulted a psychologist to see what they can do. And so her parents approach her and ask her if she would like to go and visit some of Roz's relatives for a while, just as a sort of a break. She won't eat. She won't speak. This um, psychologist fellow seems to think you need kind of a vacation from us. It's just a suggestion. We'd never send you away unless you wanted to go. Cicely finally breaks her silence and says that she wants to go. I want to go. What? What'd you say, baby? I said I want to go. Her parents are very caring in this moment, but clearly something went on with Cicely that is more than just Roz slapping her. And we're left to wonder what that is. Eve is completely devastated at this idea that her older sister is going to be basically moving out, moving away. And she's asking her, what is wrong? Was it something she did? What's wrong with you? Won't you tell me? Is it me? Is it something that I did? Of course, it's not you, Rabbit. You're my only friend. And then that is when Cicely divulges her secret. Cicely explains that the night that she had gone down with her haircut to wait for her father and the mother told her to go upstairs, that the argument that Roz and Lewis are having is partially about her and the fact that he let her go to his office. Part of it was about me and how he let me visit him that day. And partially about Maddie Moreau and, you know, their affair that they've been having. And then Eve says, so mom knows about Maddie Moreau? Mama knows about daddy and Maddie. And Cicely responds, everybody knows about Maddie Moreau. And it is now revealed that Cicely believed Eve the entire time when she came and said, hey, you know, daddy was out there with Maddie Moreau. You believe me now about what happened at the party? I believed you then. And then she goes on to explain what happened later that night that has her so upset. Cicely says that the night of the storm, she went downstairs because she was afraid of what Roz may have said to her father and that she was afraid he would divorce us and that she just wanted to make him feel better. I was afraid of what she might have said. I was afraid he would divorce us. Wanted to make him feel better. Now, part of our theory, and we're talking about Moselle's curse and that leading to Lewis's demise, we have Cicely here saying that she's afraid that her father will divorce us. One way to interpret this is that he would divorce the family, so to speak, right? These are the fears that any kid might have. But then another way to interpret this is that she views herself kind of like wife 2.0. And he would leave her in the way that he would leave Roz. And so in case you haven't quite figured it out to this point, Cicely has basically fallen in love, innocently though, with her father. And she has basically what they would call kind of like an Electra complex. She's competing with her mother for the affections of her father. And she loves her father as much as she could love any man. And so her feelings are all wrapped up together and confused. But this is directly connected to Moselle's curse. According to Cicely, she goes and she sits on her father's lap. She gives her father a kiss. And then he begins to hug and kiss her harder and wouldn't let her go. And process of all this, she's trying to get away. He didn't let her away. And then he smacks her and she falls to the floor after he smacks her and that he had never hit her before. We find out that this is what has devastated her. Eve, upon hearing this, vows to kill her father. 
for hurting her sister, Cicely. I'll kill him, Cicely. I swear. I'll kill him for hurting you. The next day, Cicely is going to be off to go live with Roz's family. Right as she's leaving, she puts her lips to her finger and makes eye contact with Eve, who is crying and upset that her sister is leaving and basically tells her to be quiet. So in other words, keep my secret, don't say anything. And Moselle, who is sitting there comforting Eve, sees this between the two sisters and is wondering what's up with that. So in a conversation with Moselle, Eve just blatantly comes out and asks, how do you kill somebody with voodoo? How do you kill someone with voodoo? Do you just wish real hard that they were dead? Or do you have to do something special? Moselle asks her why she would ask this question. And Eve has become a lot like the adults in her family, avoiding the question and learning not to answer things directly. And so she says that she doesn't know why she asked that question. What led you to that particular thought? I don't know. Well, Moselle is not going to let it go. And Moselle asks her, are you angry with somebody? Is there somebody you want that's done something that you're trying to do this to? You know, like what's going on? Is there someone around here that you're angry with? Someone that you want dead? And then she holds her hand out because she wants to read Eve. Eve gives her her hand and Moselle is like, fine. Give me your hands. Well, go on and keep secrets if you want to. I won't squeeze it out of you. The reality is that we realize now this is one strong indicator that Moselle's curse is generational and that it has now affected Eve. Because why can't Moselle read Eve? Because the future that Eve also has to share as part of her future is really part of the curse. And this is why Moselle couldn't see her husband's futures. You know, she said she saw nothing. This is exactly why. Because this is all wrapped up in the generational curse that affected Moselle and is now affecting Eve's generation with her in Sicily. Moselle ends the conversation by telling Eve that you can't kill people with voodoo. But you can't kill people with voodoo. That's ridiculous. But something about the expression on her face makes you not think that that's exactly accurate. Moselle has a secret that she is unwilling to share with Eve that is going to lead to scenes later on in the movie that basically wraps it up in terms of showing us the implications or what they want us to believe is part of the generational curses. So next we see Eve steal $20 from her father's dresser and also steal some of his hair that's in a comb and wrap it up and take it with her. And she heads on down to the market where El Zora is. Eve knows who El Zora is because earlier in the film, El Zora sees Eve basically attempt to steal a pineapple, and that's how she sees her for the first time. What's your feet? Bad girl. At the market, Eve runs into Mr. Moreau. Maddie's husband. She starts planting some seeds in his mind about what Maddie might be doing while he's gone and talks about how her mother is very lonely, but yet Maddie doesn't seem like the lonely type, implying that Maddie is hanging out with somebody, namely her father, which she, of course, already knows. My mama gets real lonely, not like daddy and Maddie. Eve finally finds El Zora and tells her that she wants to talk to her. I remember you, Pineapple Teeth. Elzora has no idea what this kid wants with her, but she asks her, hey, you got any money? You got money? Eve says she's got $20. $20. 20 Let me see. Now, for context, Elzora is doing readings for $1. This kid has 20 bucks. Elzora doesn't care what it is that Eve wants with her. She takes the $20 and puts it in her pocket. And then Eve goes with her to her house. Since Moselle won't tell Eve how to kill somebody with voodoo, this is why she's over here with El Zora. And she tells El Zora, hey, she's got somebody that she needs to get rid of. And 
Elzora starts asking her, are you related to Moselle Baptiste? Then she says, like, this is the one you want, you know, oft. Are you related to Moselle Baptiste? I'm her niece. She's the one you want dead. And then Eve is like, no. And she explains to her that that's her aunt. This gives us insight into the fact that Elzora is well aware who the Baptiste family is. They're prominent. Her father's the doctor of Eve's Bayou. So she is well aware who of who they are. She knew who Moselle was even before Moselle came and got her future told earlier in the film. This holds with our theory that Elzora knows a lot more than she's letting on. Elzora is the one who started this generational curse and, you know, because she doesn't like Moselle for whatever reason, she's like, hey, maybe this curse, you know, maybe she's the one who's the target. Elzora continues to probe and wants to find out why Eve wants this person gone. Why you want this person dead? And Eve says it's private and she won't tell. She continues and asks, hey, did this person hurt you? She said, others in my family. This person harm you? Others in my family. She said, well, I can give you something that can protect you. That's not good enough for Eve. Eve is like, I want him dead. I will give you something to protect you and your family from this person. I want him dead. Elzora is like, okay. Elzora asks Eve one last time, like, you're sure you want this done? Eve says, yes, she wants it done. For certain. You are sure? Yes, ma'am. Elzora tells Eve, hey, people got a way of dying at the wrong speed. People have a way of dying at their own speed. Now, this is more than what it might seem like on the surface, because there's no telling exactly when the men who are the targets of Moselle's curse will die. It's just that you know that it will happen eventually, right? And so Elzora tells her, hey, I'll see what I can do, but first I'm going to need some hair. I will need some hair. But we already know that Eve has come prepared and she's got locks of the hair and she gives that to Elzora as well. Elzora tells Eve to come back in a few days and that we'll see. You come back Thursday night and we will see. So we see Eve passing the time before she's got to go back on Thursday to see Elzora by doing things like sticking pins in one of her stuffed animals to practice for having a voodoo doll, which she expects to receive from Elzora, which then she can use to carry out her plan. Well, she gets to Elzora's house and Elzora asks her, is he dead yet? And Eve is like, what do you mean? How can he be dead? You haven't given me this voodoo doll yet. And Elzora is like, I'm not giving you a voodoo doll. You don't need that. I made a wax coffin and then explains what she did in order to cast this spell. The voodoo doll. I didn't make you no voodoo doll. I made you a wax coffin. Buried it in the graveyard. He should be dead by now. I thought I had to do something first. Or you did something. You brought me his hair. And then Eve is totally caught off guard because she wasn't expecting this. Eve thought that she would be in direct control over when the final end of her father would come. She's like, hold up, you know, because she wanted to be able to do it. Right. So she wasn't worried about it happening before then. But now she realizes, according to El Zora, that it could happen. I wanted it. I wanted to have it. I need it. So Elzora said she's buried this wax coffin in a snake or something down the way. And then she makes this reference and says she buried it down where all those Baptistes are buried. Where'd you bury it? Down there. Where all them Baptistes are buried. So now we get even more confirmation that Elzora knows exactly who they are, exactly what's going on. She knows about the original curse. And in fact, Elzora knows that she didn't even have to do anything for the $20 because she is a psychic and she knows exactly what's going to happen to this family next because she's part of the spell casting that was done with this original generational curse. So upon hearing this, Eve bursts out of there and now she's got to go try to find her father because she's afraid that something could happen to him. And, you know, she wants to be in control over it. 
Eve runs and it's late in the evening, but she finds her father in King's Bar with Maddie Moreau, all hugged up and being flirtatious and stuff. And she approaches her father. He's like, what are you doing here this time of night? And he's like, what's wrong? Is it somebody, you know, at the house? She's like, no, no, but I want you to come home. And so he goes, okay. And then we get to see just really how disgusting Maddie is when she rolls her eyes because here, you know, this guy's child is intervening again on her getting what she wants from Lewis. But Lewis agrees that he is going to go home with Eve. And he tells Eve, hey, go outside and wait while I say goodbye to Maddie. Baby, go outside while I say goodnight to Ms. Monroe. Eve tells her father to hurry up and say goodbye to Maddie and then cuts her eyes at Maddie on the way out of there. Hurry up. And Maddie, of course, doesn't even have the common decency to be embarrassed by her actions. While Eve is outside, she sees a figure walking toward her on the train tracks. This is the same figure that Moselle saw in her vision. And we know this to be Lenny Moreau, who is Maddie's husband, walking deliberately and angrily toward the bar where Maddie and her dad are inside. When it dawns on Eve, exactly what could happen as a result of this confrontation. She runs inside behind Mr. Moreau as well. But when Mr. Moreau goes in, he sees his wife all hugged up on Eve's father in the bar. And then when they both realize that the husband is standing there looking, Lewis, being the slick guy that he is, tries to play it off and invites him over to have a drink with them. But Mr. Moreau is not having it. Hey, old man, you're just in time to have a last one with us. I don't think so, Lewis. He confronts Lewis and says he trusted him and he loved him and that asks if he's been sleeping with his wife and then basically confirms it himself, saying, you've been sleeping with my wife. You fucking my wife? I trusted you, Lewis. And you've been fucking Maddie. I love you, Lewis. You see it look like it's about to get heated and you see Eve trying to get her father to leave. Then you also see Maddie trying to get her husband to leave so that this won't, you know, go any further. And one of the things when you guys watch this film again is you need to listen closely to the background voices because they're also giving you a commentary about this because when they see that Mr. Moreau has entered, they're like, hmm. You know, because Maddie is really the talk of the town. People have already talked about how she's a loose woman, even though she's married. And they're talking about all of this. So anyway, he says, look, I'm going to kill you if you say another word to my wife. You so much to speak to my wife again, and I will kill you. And then he turns and he leaves with his wife and you see Eve's dad finish his drink and then he goes out. Another important thing to point out is that both Maddie and Lewis accuse Mr. Moreau of being drunk. They're like, oh, you're talking crazy because you're drunk. You're drunk. You're drunk. But he really doesn't seem drunk, actually. He seems completely sober and fed up. You're drunk. You're drunk, baby. Let me take you home. Go home. Sleep off that whiskey, old man. Mr. Moreau reminds Lewis one last time, speak to her again and you're dead. You speak to her again, you're dead, Lewis. Lewis, who doesn't believe fat meat is greasy, says, you know, night Maddie and talks to her one last time. Mr. Moreau has had it. He turns around and basically if F around and find out we're a person, that is Mr. Moreau. He pulls out a revolver from his coat and just guns Lewis down right there. And then unfortunately, you see Eve screaming, daddy, daddy, as this happened. And of course, Maddie is screaming, too, as a train passes by. <laughs> The next scene we see is Lewis's funeral where Cicely is so overcome with grief that Julian basically just has to pick her up and carry her out of there. Eve is distraught and crying. Everybody is sad about what has happened. Of course, in this moment, we know Eve in her own mind is feeling like the dealings that she had with El Zora led to what happened to her father. So Moselle comes after the funeral and tells Eve that she has decided to go ahead and marry Julian and that she hopes that God will be kind to her and maybe she can go with Julian. I told Julian I would marry him. He wouldn't have it any other way. 
Maybe God will be kind and allow me to go with him. Too tired of being left alone. So again, we're back at this generational curse. We know that now that she's going to marry Julian, Julian is doomed and she just hopes that she's doomed with him. So she doesn't have to endure another loss like her other loss of her other husbands. She also tells Eve that she has a message from her father and that he says that he still owes her that dance. The dance that we talked about earlier where she was complaining about him not dancing with her at the party and that he would dance with her from then on. Well, they never had another party. He never got to give her that dance. And so he still owes it. And this is confirmation for her that her father loves her and hasn't forgotten how good his intentions were toward her. Your daddy gave me a message for you. Tell Eve I still owe her that dance. So Eve is in her father's office and decides to go through a few of his things. And she discovers a letter that her father has written to Moselle. So in the letter, Eve's father explains that Moselle has actually confronted him and accused him of doing something to Sicily. And he's like, hey, you know, I know that I'm a philanderer. I am a small town doctor and I need to feel like a hero. And these side women are making me feel good. And that is my weakness. But how could you think I would do this to my daughter? And then he refers to her as his most beloved child. How, Mosel, could I have sunk in your estimation to the leachy depths where you would accuse me of deliberately abusing my most beloved child? So imagine that Eve is reading this, understanding that just as she felt, Cicely really was his most beloved child. She continues reading and Lewis explains even further what actually happened the night of the storm. He says that that night when Cicely comes and sits on his lap, the first kiss she gave him was a kiss of redemption, the sweetest kiss that a daughter could give her drunken father who was guilt ridden. Moselle, I swear, first kiss was the sweetest kiss the daughter could give a drunk and guilt-ridden father. A kiss of redemption. He explains then that she kissed him again, basically in a romantic way, not the way that a daughter should kiss a father, and that he basically was drunk and that it took him a second to kind of realize what was happening. But when he did, he was just so startled that he smacked her to the ground and that when she looked up at him after this happened, that, you know, she was clearly so hurt that he knew he had lost her, so to speak. And she really was because we saw what happened after the fact. He said that, you know, he wishes he could do it all over again and that he if he had to do over, obviously wouldn't have hit her and that he would have just explained to her basically how what happened was you know, inappropriate and that they would have departed that night with the boundaries between father and daughter intact. But he never got that opportunity. Moselle, I would give my life to have that moment back. I would hold her and comfort her. We would talk through her confusion and I would put her to bed with the boundaries between us intact. He asks for Moselle's forgiveness for not telling her or Roz because he didn't want to betray her again. Felt I could not betray her again by telling you or Rosalind. Forgive me. But basically, he felt really bad about what had happened. So when you think about it, here Roz was thinking that Cecily was acting like she was acting because Roz had smacked her. And then here we are again with the father having smacked her. Like Cecily went through some things in this last, you know, few days around the time of the storm. And so now we're sitting in the situation where we realize that Cecily's account of what happened was actually not accurate. Eve goes to confront Cecily and accuses her of lying. You lied. Daddy wrote Moselle a letter. You lied. Cecily insists that she didn't actually lie. I wasn't lying. I believed you. I hated him for you. So then Eve is like, tell me what happened. And Cicely is like, I, I, I really don't know what happened. And so, of course, now for the first time, we see Eve hold her hands out for Cicely to put her hands in it so that Eve can read her sister. And when Eve reads Cicely, she realizes that Cicely does not have a memory of anything except being slapped. And so what happened was 
kind of these jumbled up memories and things that happened for Cicely. And so Cicely, in her mind, was telling the truth. But unfortunately, you know, the father was the target of the implications. So after realizing that Cicely truly didn't know what happened that night, Eve decides that she's going to sink the letter in the swamp so that no one knows except her and Cicely that her father had written this letter, that all of this had happened, that Moselle had made the accusation or anything. So she sinks the letter and then pretty much the movie ends. But this time, adult Eve narrator says the night he said goodnight instead of saying that she killed him like she did at the beginning of the movie. The summer my father said goodnight. I was 10 years old. Memory is a selection of images, some elusive, Others printed indelibly on the brain. So now we've got everything laid out that actually happened in the movie. We need to tie together all of these loose ends so that you guys fully understand how we have completely justified the idea that this is a generational curse that has affected not only Moselle, but also Cecily and Eve. So what actually did Lewis in was this curse. His daughter fell in love with him and saw him as this love interest. And she was cursed, just like Moselle is cursed, cursed in the same way. And he died as a result of that. Of course, the movie has you thinking, first, they try to lead you in the direction that Eve's attempted curse that she does with El Zora is the thing that causes her father to die. But by the end, we realize, OK, what we thought happened and why we were mad at him. We really shouldn't be mad at him for that. That's not exactly what happened. And then Eve is not to blame. Of course, we know he's a philanderer and we see the circumstances of his death. And so we say, OK, Eve is definitely not the reason. But the reason actually is this curse. It's not simply that he was messing around with this woman on the side and that her husband took him out. Because if you remember when Maynard got killed, that's the second husband of Moselle. What happens there is that he is taken out by Moselle's lover. So while it involves some of this adulterous type of behavior, that's not the only thing that could happen. So that sort of ties everything in. And so it is the connection that he has to Sicily that causes Lewis's death. That's right. So you might be wondering where that original curse actually started. We suspect, like we said, that El Zora is the one who laid that original curse. But we don't know why she did it. I suspect because she seemed to be motivated by the money, right? You saw where she lived. She just wants to make money off of her gift. And so somebody could have easily come and said, hey, we're putting this on Moselle. It could even be from the generation before Moselle to Moselle's mother because uh, we didn't see Moselle's father in here. So we don't exactly know who was the one who wanted the curse? It could very well have been El Zora. It could have been somebody that said, hey, here's some money. I want you to put this curse on this family, these people. But it seems like there is a lot of evidence that this was definitely a generational curse and that pretty soon we're going to see it affect Eve too. She'll find that piece of it out. But maybe she'll be able to navigate it. Maybe she just won't actually take a husband. Yeah, because that's part of what uh, Moselle was trying to show her, basically what happens with this gift and this curse that she has. Right, because it's like a double-edged sword. So there you have it. That's our Eve's Bayou fan theory. Yes. And one of the things that came up after this fan theory, there was so much controversy because a lot of people saw it. This was a video that brought a lot of people to the channel and by the way that's the axiom amnesia channel which is not this channel here the heightened sharia of axiom amnesia it's our other channel so if you want to make sure you're subscribed to all of our channels check the links in the description and then you can subscribe and if you go to discord you can be up to the minute on what we have going on yes so one of the things that did come up is the fact that there is a director's cut and we finally had a chance to view the director's cut now in the director's cut there are these scenes with uncle toomey who is the uncle who is the disabled uncle of Eve that's there in the house. And so there's a scene where the uncle witnesses is a witness to the encounter between the father and Cecily. Right. And so on the internet somewhere else and people in um, comments were saying 
that this scene is proof that some that the father definitely did something to Cecily and, you know, yeah. all of this and that. It's kind of the same way that what happened with our with Friday, where everyone just says that there is this scene that shows that Ezel had the boxes and then you show it to him and it's not there. And then they're like, but I seen it or someone says somebody bring up something and then people take it as fact, even though you may not have seen it. Right. Or you already have your bias to, and now you think you have evidence to claim that this is what actually happened. But in the movie, Uncle Toomey, he is there, but it doesn't show anything different than what we actually saw in the theatrical release. Right. And actually, uh, Casey or Cassie Lemons, who was the director and wrote this film, has a whole discussion where she talks about her intentions and what you know uh, as she is presenting this and we can just do a whole nother video discussion this part but i did want to address it in this video because i do recognize that this is sensitive subject matter and a lot of people when they watch this are triggered by what happens here and i think it's okay to have whatever interpretation that you do have but i do believe that that interpretation should be supported by especially in this case should be supported by the evidence within the film and not really like fan theory type mm. evidence, but what actually exists within the film. Um, Casey Lemon said that basically the uncle is this, he's a mute witness who can't really say what he saw, but he did see something. And so the scenes that had been cut out of the original film were basically of the uncle seeing them kiss the father and the daughter. And so the uncle has the answer. The big answer is whether who kissed whom first, right? Because we have Cecily with one set of um, remembrances, right? And then we have what the father said happened, right? The father says Cecily did something. And so did Cecily for most of the movie seemed to imply that the father did something to her. But then at the end, when Eve figures out what went on, then there's this controversy about, you know, these memories and are the memories real and which is the, you know, what actually happened. So there is an objective truth, but that objective truth is hidden away, locked away with Uncle Toomey yeah. because he can't speak and tell what he saw happen. But it was never on the table that like the father had done something even more to her because some people even went so far as to be like, you know, because Cecily had uh, had her first menstruation. Uh, that that wasn't really what that was and that that was because the father had done something to her. And, you know, and that's just not how I see the movie. It doesn't appear to be how the director intended for the movie to be. It was never supposed to be something yeah. that went that far. Yeah, there is nothing to say that this exactly happens. Right. And that's part of what the director and writer said is that, you know, there is this objective truth out there and it's locked with Uncle Toomey. But you have each side which could have happened, but we just never know. So to just come and claim that this is what happened is just your take on it. And you, I guess you could try to convince people of that, but that's not what the art is intended to do. Right. And, um, and, and just to reiterate, once again, the question of what happened was always only about this, this kiss. It was never about, you know, did something more than the kiss really happen? It was just who started it and, you know, whatever happened from that end. Casey Lemon said that basically the studio is the reason why he got cut out of the whole film. You know, and she was really disappointed that they ended up cutting it out mm -hmm. because, you know, she had somebody in her family who was, uh, I guess, disabled like this. And it kind of represented that person. And also that you the idea that you did have this objective truth somewhere else that we couldn't get to. Right. Because with the original cut of the film, you never see the uncle. So you don't know that anybody knows this answer. Well, the uncle, you can see him way in the background on the porch, but he's never really presented as an actual character. Like he was technically intended to be completely cut out of the film, but you know, in a little snippets, you can see him like on the porch in the background and stuff like that. But in the director's cut, you do see what she intended for the movie to be from the beginning. But I mean, this was years after the movie was released and after, you know, everybody, you know, was uh, famous or first seen in these movies um, or in this movie. So I guess I walk away from it feeling like in this case, 
especially with the sensitive subject matter, I do think it's important to know what she intended. Um, and yeah. you know, I mean, but people going to, you know, you, you can have your own interpretation, whatever you want to think and believe, but I did at least want to defend it because let me just say this also, I feel like in a world where so many things happen to youth that a relationship that was actually portrayed well of a loving father, you know, that like the question is, do we besmirch that image? We came across this when we talked about our other fan theory that we did for Boys in the Hood, where we, as a fan theory, questioned whether or not Doughboy's father could have been Furious Styles. And we, you know, um, played with that and, and, and put it out there. But one of the things that we talked about later in the discussion was the fact that, you know, even when we suggested it as a fan theory, not to say this is the absolute fact, but this is our this is a theory right, that could be true, the question was like, oh, man, you know, Furious Styles was such a good father, and to suggest that he had a child within the same community, that he wasn't fathering as good as Trey, the child who he, you know, who was obviously his, um, what does that do to the image of the Black father? And so, you know, I always felt a little, I think we both did, kind of like, you know, but it was a fan theory and we hoped that the viewers could be mature yeah. enough to understand that this was a fan theory. We're not trying to destroy the image of the Black Father. We're just saying, what if this happened? And then showing you evidence from the film that, hey, maybe this is possible, right? Yeah, but um, this, our attachment to fictional characters is crazy in adulthood. <laughs> but, you know, and people were like, oh, he's not the type of person, right? Or do you think he's furious as the type of person? If I lay it out like this, then yes, he is, because that's what this evidence shows. <laughs> yeah, that it, that it is definitely possible, is the type of person. Right, right. The whole idea is that it is possible. You know, so back to Eve's Bayou and this question, you know, for me, I defended it. It defended the father, not because he was a terrible husband. But the question is, was he a bad father? What And, and strictly about fathering, not about the effect of his philandering and being in them streets that that had on the daughters and you know but I mean just as a his relationship with his daughters was his relationship with his daughters um was he a good father or not and coming from a background where I feel like I had a good dad I had good a good grandfather you know people who um loved me the right way you know what I'm saying and I think that there are a lot of people who had those experiences and I just don't want to turn every single um father, daughter, grandfather, granddaughter relationship into something that in, in this movie, I didn't perceive it as being, but that's my take. You know, everybody has their own life experiences and their own takes. And I definitely respect that. So I'm not saying that people are wrong to interpret uh, the film through their own lens, but I just think sometimes we have to make sure that there is adequate evidence for that. But you know, at the end of the day, we can actually, if you're interested, go ahead and put it in the comments that you, whether you want us to break down that scene with the, the scenes that have Uncle Toomey, because there are a few of them uh, in the film that were originally cut. We'd be happy to do that if you want to do that. But anyway, there was another question that we always had about Aunt Moselle, right? Uh, you know, and the fact that she was kind of this black widow and that all of her husbands would die. Do you think that Moselle told Julian? And here is what we had to say on that. Do you think that Moselle told Julian that he, the guy she fell in love with, that he was likely to meet a bad end because he was dealing with her just like the rest of her husbands? And we want to talk about whether Moselle ever told Julian, her fiance, that marrying her would lead to his untimely end. Mm hmm. But those of you who don't know in the movie, Moselle is cursed such that all of her lovers meet an untimely end. Her third husband, Harry, has just died as a result of that curse. We do see Harry's name on a tombstone. So the indications are that something bad has happened. Right. It shows a spider twice. The second time we see spider, it appears to be two spiders and one spider is consuming the other spider. So in the next scene, it's confirmed when we see Eve placing flowers on Harry's grave and she says, Uncle Harry, Uncle Menard and Uncle Anderson. So these are the three husbands of her Aunt Moselle 
who have had an untimely passing. After visiting the cemetery where she places flowers on the graves of her uncles, Eve goes to Moselle's house where Moselle is still in bed and it's midday and she's disheveled and she has a flower to bring her to. Clearly, Moselle is completely devastated by the loss of Harry. And remember, Moselle was the one driving the car when they had the car accident. And remember, right before they left, she said, get in the car before I kill you. No, just give wait. me the damn keys, Harry. Now get in the goddamn car before I kill you. And in reality, he got in the car and she killed him. Elzora tells Moselle that she basically doesn't even have to throw out the bones to find out what her fortune is. I don't need no cat bones to tell your fortune, Moselle Baptiste. And then goes on to tell Moselle that she's a black widow. She is cursed. You are a curse. The black widow. And any man that marries you is going to meet his end just like the other ones. And it'll always be that way. Next man who marries you is a dead man like the others. Always be that way. After the death of her most recent husband, Harry, that we just saw there, Moselle falls madly in love with Julian, an artist who wanders in town looking for his wife who's left him. So a guy shows up at Moselle's door and apparently he wants a reading or some counseling. And it is hinted that there will be a love here between Moselle and Julian. But if you think back to what happened with Elzora, then we know that any such love and according to this curse, if they fall in love and wed, then demise is coming for and a sure death is coming for Julian. When Julian shows up, it kind of makes you feel sorry for him already. And in a way, you all, you don't really want to see him get wrapped up in Moselle's curse because he seems like a nice guy and he confesses, hey, I've been looking for my wife for this year. My wife left me a year ago. And he's lost everything. So he doesn't even have a home to go back to once if he ever finds her, but that he can't stop looking for her because he just has to know he needs an answer. And it's really quite sad. And he seems like this nice guy and you hate to see something bad happen to him. But ne neither of them could fight the feeling. Julian is an artist and he paints this beautiful portrait of Moselle. And then, you know, it pans away from the portrait to bow chicka wow wow. Initially, Moselle avoids letting Julian make a commitment to her because she knows what fate he's going to meet. So presumably some time has passed and we see Julian and Moselle together having a conversation. And Julian is saying, hey, I got to go find my wife. I have to find my wife. Of course, his wife has fallen in love with someone else. And Moselle tries to tell him, like, look, she's not coming back to you. And then I told you she's not coming back. She's fallen in love. And he's like, oh, I'm not looking for her for that. I'm looking for her to divorce her so that I can marry you, Moselle. And then that's when Moselle kind of panics a little bit and says hey you can't marry me now but you can't possibly marry me i can't let that happen we all know why moselle doesn't want him to marry her because she knows what his fate will be if he does then she tries to tell him the truth and she says okay bear with me and then she says i'm cursed bear with me i'm cursed but instead of saying, look, I'm cursed and every man I marry meets a bad end, she says, I'm cursed and I'm barren. I can't have children. I'm barren. So she kind of doesn't have the guts to actually say what the real deal is, probably because she's afraid of losing him, I would guess. However, toward the end of the film, Moselle tells her niece, Eve, that she's actually going to marry Julian. So Moselle comes after the funeral and tells Eve that she has decided to go ahead and marry Julian and that she hopes that God will be kind to her and maybe she can go with Julian. I told Julian I would marry him. He wouldn't have it any other way. Maybe God will be kind and allow me to go with him. I'm tired of being left alone. So again, we're back at this generational curse. We know that now that she's going to marry Julian, Julian is doomed and she just hopes that she's doomed with him. So she doesn't have to endure another loss like her other loss of her other husbands. This left us wondering whether Moselle ever confessed to Julian that marrying her would ensure his untimely end. 
So this caught you pretty much up with what happened in the movie in case you needed a refresher. So here we are at the end of the movie. And, you know, she's like, I'm marrying Julian. And I can't help but wonder, like, does she ever tell this guy that your life is in jeopardy? So I think that part of it was that she didn't really believe it per se. Or you have this foolish hope. Right. Yeah. You know, because a lot of times, you know, that things we know that things are for sure. But we're like, but maybe not this time. That's why when she talked to El Zora and El Zora basically said, yes, it's going to happen. You know, you're still under whatever this curse is. Right. Mm -hmm. But you she basically uh, confirms this for you. And you're like, no, no, because I'm trying to forget about all of that. Right. And. You know, that's why she reacted that way with Elzora, because she still has some hope that this wasn't really true. Yeah, well, I look at it and I think that she made her decision not to tell Julian pretty much after she had the opportunity when she was trying to get him not to want to marry her. Then finally, after Lewis, her brother, passes away, um, then we see her like, look, I just decided to go ahead and marry him. I love him. And, you know, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And maybe I'll be lucky enough to meet my end with him. So I couldn't help but feel like that was the case. But I definitely think she decided not to tell him. And plus, in her mind, she's probably like, look, you know, it doesn't matter anymore because, you know, he's not going to know what's coming just the same way as Harry and the other ones didn't know it was coming. Right. They just. Yeah. And met their in. Maybe it's a commentary on love, too. If you really love someone, it doesn't matter because a. Hey, I'm doing this for Julian who loves me. And if you know, he's really loves me, then he doesn't, it doesn't matter because he still gets to be with me. Right. I know. In the, in the end, because now that would make it like, whoa, this is such an amazing love story that, because that's what a, a lot of love stories are. Right. Sacrifice. Uh, yeah. So I know that I love this person so much that something terrible is going to happen to me, but I still am going to choose to go and do that thing and be with that person. But then there are some love stories where the sacrifices that you let the person go so that they don't meet the bad end that they'll meet if they keep being involved with you. Um, I can't I don't know. For some reason, butter the butterfly effect. The first one comes to mind, yeah, like where, you know, he's trying to bring her back and he finally realizes is that, you know, he's the one who can't be yeah. born. But those are the two perspectives, right? Mm -hmm. One perspective is Julian, this great sacrifice that I may be, I may die. And from her perspective, somewhat, she don't care because, or she looks at it that he don't care, right? Mm -hmm. And from her perspective, it's, well, I'm not making that sacrifice, right? I'm just going to go and do this. I'm not going to make the sacrifice to let him go. If you're watching and listening to this right now, let us know in the comments whether or not you think that Moselle ever told Julian that, you know, pretty much he was doomed from the start if, she, if he married her and decided to stay with her. So this brings me to the question that since you and I both agree that Moselle did not tell Julian, was Moselle wrong for not being straight up with Julian from the beginning. Like pretty much after y'all, you know, got it on that first night after he, you know, painted the picture. Like, was she wrong for not telling him, like, look, I got this curse up on my head and. It's multiple things. So you got the you got this interpretation of that. It's because of your actions why they're dying. Right. Because mm. you're a cheater. right? Mm. You don't tell him about those things about cheating. And another is if it is a curse and you believe it and you tell him that uh, me as a man, I'm like, wait, what? What are you talking about? So the you second in case and I'm going to you... die. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we kind of have to just lay this out, too. So her she's been married three times. Her third husband, Harry. So Julian would be the fourth. So the second husband was Maynard and the first husband was Anderson. But anyway, so the second husband is the one that she had been stepping out and cheating on. And then her lover had killed him. Right. So she brought yeah. that on. But the third husband, when he died, she was the one driving the car like we just showed you a few minutes ago. And so it's always that she seemed to have some hand in it, which always leaves it a little bit up to. Is it fate? Is it the curse or is it just bad luck? <laughs> yeah, because that sort of thing, you know, uh, outside of the movie, when bad things happen to a pe to people, they mm -hmm. just chalk it up to it's a curse it has to be a curse why else would bad luck fall upon me so right. often 
It can't be that. But, yeah. So what if she did tell him? So one thing is, if she believes it and she don't tell him, then that's some uh being some dishonesty, mm-hmm. right? But because the act of telling him could push him away, right? And if it is true, that too can push him away, right? Yeah. yeah. But not telling him is dishonesty, which in turn, which comes to our next point, could push him away. <laughs> Yes. She's like doesn't win with this guy, I don't think. Well, she can't win with any guy if you believe the curse, right? Yeah. She, she's not going to win with any guy. You know, and it's kind of sad because really what happened to Harry, you know, I guess is a fluke accident that could have happened to anybody. I think it was, you know, she's driving. She was only driving really because Harry had had too much to drink. And that whole argument had right. happened. Right, that's that was the uh, the irony of the whole scene. Mm-hmm. And I like how they didn't reveal that the curse really until after this happened because you just think, oh man, they were trying to be safe, and shit just happens sometimes, right? Mm-hmm. And then you realize, wait a minute, this is something else. It probably would have been better if he was driving. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because even drunk, he he might not have, you know ended um maybe it still would have happened because it was her but so this idea and to kind of get back to one of the things she said which was that oh maybe i'll be lucky you know she's always so starry-eyed and dreaming right back to maybe kind of this fool's dream even though i know all the evidence is adding up to like every dude i get with this is a bad end I'm going to wish and hope that it would be different this time. But her dream this time is like, okay, we're not going to dream he doesn't die. We'll just dream that I go with him. Right. But then then it doesn't cut the same way. Right. Because if she had gone with any one of her previous husbands, she'd just been gone. It'd been like, okay, whatever. No, the curse, the bad part of it is that you have to live through it. Right. You have all these losses. Like she says, she's tired of getting left behind. It's the curse to get left behind. Right. Yeah, that's that's the whole thing. It's wrapped up in that. So I don't think she'll be that lucky. Uh I think that Julian going to meet his end somehow. You know, maybe a paintbrush will just fly across the room and impale him in the eye. This is not a (laughs) final destination. (laughs) But do you think somebody from the town might have told Julian that she was cursed? I don't think yes. It right? has to happen. It has to, because that's how he found out about her in the first place was he was like, oh, the townspeople yeah. say you are a reader or whatever. Right. Yeah. And he believes in it. So back to what I said before, he probably would believe her. So I was wrong on that point. He would believe her if she said, hey, yo, I'm cursed. M- well, maybe. Listen, he might believe anybody else. But see, he's in it. Right. He's already in love by the time they're. Yeah. But no, the reason I said that was that the idea that someone would believe something like that couldn't push a man away. Mm, mm -hmm. But just that idea isn't something that would be an affront to right in affront for Julian. Somebody has to be like, hey, yeah, she's uh, even if it's not she's cursed. It's like, man, you know, everybody she mess with come up dead <laughs> i know so. he's gonna be playing poker somewhere when you know once he starts getting in with the townspeople or <laughs> the whispers at one of the parties you know like the party that the movie opened with and you see him and he's over there um because he's become part of the family through everything else that happens in this movie um speaking of everything else that happens in this movie we have a fan theory uh completely separate from this discussion on eve's bayou and it is linked in the description and if by chance you haven't seen it you should be checking out that fan theory yes you should because if you abreast of fan theories and you know something about fan theories you know you could pick apart which parts are part of the actual fan theory but we really go through the entire movie Mm -hmm. and what happened and you know throw in the bits that are applicable to the fan theory in there like it's a a breakdown and a fan theory yep you know so um but back to this whole discussion the question is we agree that the townspeople are going to talk he's going to hear some chatter about like you know you the fourth one and the other three are dead you know as far as moselle's husbands let's just rewind for a second and say if you were julian and Moselle told you that you were doomed, would you still stick around and marry her? I, no. First off, like, what is you talking about? What you going to do to me? Right. <laughs> <laughs> and if not, what does what you know? If it's true, I'm doomed. You know, if it's true that it's a curse. If it's true that you're saying it, that something's going to happen to me, or are you going to do something to me? And 
Or are you just out of your mind by saying this? I Either think way, I it's go. bad and you're just like, I'm bouncing. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to put my mind, you know, in the mind of a man. And this woman is coming to me telling me this in 1960s and everything. I think it depends on when she decided to tell. Because if she tells you this up front and you're not in love with her and you just slept with her the one night, it's just like, all right, well, listen, I'm gonna go ahead and keep on looking for my wife, you know, and that can be the end of it. Right. But if you've already been there for some weeks and you're really starting to love, if you're already attached, the decision becomes a lot harder. No, it don't. <laughs> it did. I'll be like, so are you, you're, you're being serious. <laughs> and if you're serious, I must go. <laughs> So that should let y'all know that there'll be no crazy town with height. I can't come to Kite and be like, listen up. Um, I'm seeing yeah, these like things. those YouTube pranks <laughs> and stuff. People do know this is not happening. <laughs> How you going to be saying it while he's packing his this, bags? It'll be video you cannot upload. <laughs> like, <laughs> no, because it's not going to look good on camera. Like, I don't know how they do that. Like. If it was, if I'm Julian and let's say there's this camera piercing down and she comes and tells him, <laughs> all right, throwing up the deuce, I'm out. There is no, really no back and forth and laughs for you. The video is over at that it's point. I'm done. walking out the door. This is crazy. <laughs> what I'll say is just that it, for me, from my opinion, and maybe this is why I'm a woman, but from my opinion, I think it's easy to walk away in the beginning. I think it's much harder to walk away once you're already in love, even if the person is, you know. Yeah. I mean, because you accept them with their shortcomings and it just yeah, happens. Yeah, but if that, you're talking about you going to end up dead, <laughs> nah, man, I'm not there. I mean, yeah, I agree. <laughs> I, but, but because it's in this area of gray, because it's like, okay. yeah, the when prediction... we, we take into the whole the voodoo and the spirituality stuff that's going on in the movie. Right. OK, so if I'm in the different. movie, if I'm in the movie, yeah, I'm probably going to be like, listen, it ain't going well. If it's real life, it's different no. because if it's real life, I'm out of there. If it's in a the movie, then it's like, oh, well, maybe we could find some. Uh, oh, uh, uh, some some the other. Yeah. Oh, OK. All right. I, I, I agree with that argument. I actually like that angle. We just go on an adventure and we figure out a way to reverse El Zora's curse. Like the cure. Yeah. Down in the swamps <laughs> of the bayou. There's an interesting dynamic there. If Moselle never tells Julian, we agreed that she was wrong for that. But let's say that Julian marries Moselle like they're planning to. And then he eventually leaves her for whatever reason. But let's just say maybe it's for his first wife. Would he still Bruh. be doomed? Oh, if the curse is real. Mm -hmm. Yes, but it depends on the particulars of the curse. Do you have to still be in love with him? Do y'all understand that in the chat? Answer that question in the comments. <laughs> if Julian marries Moselle, so now he's cursed and he's supposed to die. And then Julian's like, hey, I'm up for whatever reason. He leaves her. And maybe he doesn't even go back to his wife, goes to somebody else, goes to be alone. Is he still cursed if he's not with Moselle, but he has married Moselle at one point? Mm. So this curse is her curse, but it curses the men because they happen to fall in under her curse. So can he like shake the curse off if he gets out of it? I there? don't know what, but I'm saying the particulars is the curse that while she's in love, because maybe she can fall out of love after they leave. Or is it that once you've been uh bitten by mm -hmm. the black widow right because yeah. you know they did compare it to like a black widow but then the and the, the, i the, think the spider they showed wasn't a black widow but yeah okay. but they called her the black widow yes they did and so i believe the black widow is the one who devours their mate yes so it would have to be during you know while they are together if mm -hmm. we're gonna go ride that full out the curse out full yeah into that aspect of being a black, a black widow curse per se. So if he escapes her grasp, then yeah, he, if he has get survives. out the web. He's all right. Hmm. But maybe that means that I like that logic. Does it make him a, a male black widow? Because you can only go once you become a black widow, then you have to go to another black widow or do spiders, uh, do interspecies. <laughs> no, nah, I think, I think <laughs> it has no, nope. I think if he makes it out of there, he's free. He yeah. will survive. Hmm. He has gotten out of the 
entanglement of the curse. I yes. don't know. Y'all let us know in the comments. <laughs> so that's what we thought about it. There's so much that we can discuss about uh, all of these movies that just never get, it never comes up, mm -hmm. right? Or we never get to it. Other people just, you know, kind of gloss over the movies and stuff. So a lot of these movies we can come back and just uh, continue to talk about them more and more. Yeah, that's true, you know, um, and I love these discussions. And, you know, it's funny because we put this video um, related to Eve's Bayou out before we really had this channel going. But, you know, in retrospect, I look at it and I feel like that that video would have been best placed on this channel if this channel was up and running, yeah. you know, at the time. And get ready for Beloved. If you made it this far into this video, type my perspective in the comments so we know you're one of the real ones who stick around to the end. And as always, thank y'all so much. We enjoy it when you tag us, when people are sharing our ideas all around social media. So keep doing that. You can tag us at Axiom Amnesia on any social media. And be sure to check out one of the videos on the screen right now.